What happened at Normandy? Normandy, a region in northwestern France that lies along the English Channel, is known for the June 6, 1944, arrival of Allied troops, which proved to be a turning point in World War II, 1939-45. Officially called Operation Overlord, but known historically as D-Day, and headed by General Dwight D. Eisenhower, 1890-1969, of the United States. The initiative had been in the planning since 1943 and it constituted the largest seaborne invasion in history. After several delays due to poor weather. The Allied troops crossed the English Channel and arrived on the beaches of Normandy on the morning of June 6. Brutal fighting ensued that day, with heavy losses on both sides. At the end of the day, the Allied troops had taken hold of the beaches a firm foothold that would allow them to march inland against the Nazis, eventually pushing them back to Germany. While it was a critical Allied victory, which history has treated as the beginning of the end for German Chancellor and Führer Adolf Hitler, the invasion at Normandy was still to be followed by 11 more months of bloody conflict. Germany would not surrender until May 7 of the following year. Was Beethoven really deaf for much of his life? Yes, Ludwig van Beethoven, 1770 to 1827, suffered a gradual hearing loss during his 20s. And eventually lost his hearing altogether in his early 30s. The loss was devastating to the German composer. In a letter to his brother he wrote, But how humbled I feel when someone near me hears the distant sound of a flute. And I hear nothing, when someone hears a shepherd singing, and I hear nothing. At one point he even contemplated suicide but instead continued his work. He had studied briefly with Mozart, in 1787, and Joseph Haydn, in 1792. And appeared for the first time in his own concert in 1800. While the loss of his hearing later prevented him from playing the piano properly, it did nothing to hold back his creativity. Between 1800 and 1824, Beethoven wrote nine symphonies, and many believe that he developed the form to perfection. His other works include five piano concertos and 32 piano sonatas, as well as string quartets. Sonatas for piano and violin, opera, and vocal music, including oratorios. It was about the time that he completed his work on his third symphony. The Eroica, 1804, that he went completely deaf. Though he was himself a classicist, music critics often refer to a turning point marked by the Eroica. Which shows the complexity of the Romantic Age of Music. A true genius. Beethoven's innovations include expanding the length of both the symphony and the piano concerto. Increasing the number of movements in the string quartet, from 4 to 7. And adding instruments including the trombone, contrabassoon, and the piccolo to the orchestra, giving it a broader range. 
through his adventurous piano compositions. Beethoven also heightened the status of the instrument, which was a relatively new invention, 1710. Among his most well-known and most often performed works are his third, Eroica, fifth, sixth, pastoral, and ninth, choral, symphonies, as well as the fourth and fifth piano concertos. It is remarkable even unfathomable that these works, so familiar to so many, were never heard by their composer. A poignant anecdote tells of Beethoven sitting on stage to give tempo cues to the conductor during the first public performance of his Ninth Symphony. When the performance had ended, Beethoven his back to the audience was unaware of the standing ovation his work had received until a member of the choir turned Beethoven's chair around so he could see the tremendous response. Who was the first to reach Mount Everest's summit? New Zealander Sir Edmund Hillary, 1919 was the first person to climb to the summit of Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world. Everest, in the Himalaya Mountains, between Nepal and Tibet, rises nearly five and a half miles, 29,028 feet, above sea level. After numerous climbers made attempts on Everest between 1921 and 1952, Hillary reached the top on May 29, 1953, as part of a British-led expedition. He was followed by fellow climber Tenzing Norgay, 1914-1986, a Nepalese Sherpa. Hillary took a picture of Tenzing at the summit. But Tenzing did not know how to work the camera so there is no picture of Hillary. The Sir was added to Hillary's name by Queen Elizabeth II, 1926, who took great pleasure in the fact that the triumph on Everest had been achieved by a British expedition. Having been crowned on June 2, 1953, it was one of her first official acts as Queen. The mountain was named for another Briton, Sir George Everest. 1790 to 1866 who served as a british surveyor general of india from 1830 to 1843 tibetans call the mountain komaluma and the nepalese call it sagarmatha were the anthrax attacks acts of terrorism Yes, as you. As Attorney General John Ashcroft said. When people send anthrax through the mail to hurt people and invoke terror, it's a terrorist act. Investigators believed the attacks. Which killed five people and sickened 17 others, were acts of domestic terrorism. But whoever was responsible for mailing anthrax spores in the fall of 2001 remained unknown in mid 2005. Some observers believed the attacks were carried out to expose the nation's vulnerability to bioterrorist attacks.
How old is the calendar? The calendar that is in general use today is the Gregorian calendar. It dates to 1582, when Pope Gregory XIII, 1502-1585, asked for a revision of the Julian calendar. That calendar is named for its initiator, Julius Caesar, 100-44 BC. Who in about 46 BC commissioned the astronomer Sosagenes of Alexandria to develop a universal solar calendar to be used throughout the Roman Empire. As Roman armies conquered more and more territory. The empire included many peoples and differing calendars, including the lunar-based Roman calendar. The Julian calendar consisted of a year of 365 days, with one day added every fourth year, leap year. When the year is divisible by four, to compensate for the fact that the solar year is really 365.25 days. It had 12 months, each of 30 or 31 days except February, which had 28, and the new year began. On January 1st, the Gregorian calendar retained these features but revised the Julian to bring the Christian celebration of Easter in alignment with the vernal equinox, first day of spring. It also dropped leap years for any century year not divisible by 400 an effort to keep the solar calendar in line with the seasons. For example, 1900, though divisible by 4, was not a leap year since it was a centenary year not divisible by 400, the year 2000, divisible by 400, was a centenary leap year. What is the Hippocratic Oath? The Hippocratic Oath is the pledge taken by many medical students upon graduation or upon entering into practice. While the text of the oath varies by translation, one important line reads, I will prescribe regiment for the good of my patients according to my ability and my judgment and never to harm anyone. The vows are attributed to the Greek physician and teacher Hippocrates. C 460 C 377 BC, who practiced on the island of Kos. Unlike his predecessors, who relied on superstitious practices in their treatment of patients. Hippocrates believed that diseases were brought on not by supernatural causes but by natural ones. He further believed that disease could be studied and cured, this assertion forms the basis of modern medicine. Which is why Hippocrates is called the father of medicine. It is largely owing to another prominent Greek physician that the oath was handed down through history. Galen, AD 129 C 199, was physician to Roman emperors Marcus Aurelius. 121 to 80, from 161 and Lucius Commodus, 161 to 92, from 168. He demonstrated that arteries carry blood, not air. As had been thought, and, like Hippocrates, Galen believed in the four humors of the body. He left medical texts that for centuries were considered the authoritative works on medical practice. Galen's writings reveal his high regard for Hippocrates, who lived and worked many centuries earlier.
When was the flush toilet invented? The invention dates to the 1590s and is credited to Sir John Harrington. 1561 to 1612, hence its nickname, the John. A courtier and godson of England's Queen Elizabeth I, 1533 to 1603. Harrington installed a flush lavatory in one of the Queen's palaces. Though he was a serious scholar and translator. Harrington was also a rebel who wrote controversial satire, leading to his banishment. His invention of the so-called water closet was not taken seriously in its day. But over the following two centuries various inventors worked to improve it. Ultimately developing the plumbed sanitary toilet, a flush commode that is connected to plumbing and sewers or septic tanks. How did the Democratic Party begin? The other and older principal party in the United States today, the Democratic Party was founded around electing Thomas Jefferson. 1743 to 1826, to office in 1800, against Alexander Hamilton's Federalist Party. The party's platform favored personal liberty and the limitation of federal government. Installing Jefferson in office, the party then called the Democratic Republicans went on to get its candidates into the White House for the next 25 years. In 1828 they became known simply as Democrats, dropping the suffix. Depending on how one counts, there have been either 18 or 19 Democratic presidents, Andrew Johnson. 1808 to 1875, is problematic since he was a Democrat before joining the National Union Party ticket as the vice presidential candidate in 1864. Some sources list both party affiliations, as in Democratic slash National Union. Who was Dorothea Dix? Dorothea Lindy Dix, 1802-1887 Was a philanthropist and among the first American women to become active in social reform. Having been headmistress of her own school for girls in Boston from 1821 to 1836, in 1841 Dix toured Massachusetts State Correctional Institutions, where she was shocked to see deplorable treatment of the mentally ill. Thereafter Dix became an impassioned advocate for the mentally ill, leading a drive to build hospitals for the specialized care of those afflicted with mental illnesses. Dix appealed to the consciences of legislators and philanthropists. She was successful in establishing mental hospitals throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe, many of which still bear her name. Dix's campaign for humane treatment of the mentally ill transformed American attitudes and institutions in the two decades that led up to the Civil War, 1861-65. During the war she acted as superintendent of the U.S. Army nurses. She also worked to improve prison conditions during her lifetime.
Why was Julius Caesar murdered? The Roman general and statesman Julius Caesar, 100-44b. C. Was stabbed to death in the Senate House by a group of men, including some of his former friends. Who viewed him as an ambitious tyrant and a threat to the Roman Republic. The date of the assassination, March 15, fell into relatively common usage thanks to William Shakespeare's tragedy. Julius Caesar, written in the late 1590s, which has a soothsayer warning the Roman general to beware the Ides of March after Caesar's death in 44 BC. A triumvirate was formed to rule Rome, with Lepidius, Octavian, who would in 27 BC become Augustus, the Roman Empire's first ruler, and Mark Antony sharing power. It was Mark Antony, c. 83-30 BC. Of Antony and Cleopatra of fame, who aroused the mobs against Caesar's conspirators, driving them out of Rome. The events illustrate the controversy about Julius Caesar. While some clearly viewed him as a demagogue who forced his way into power, others considered the patrician-born Caesar. A man of noble character who defended the rights of the people in an oligarchic state where the government was controlled by a few people who had only their own interests in mind. This divided opinion has followed Caesar throughout history. While opinion is still divided on what kind of a ruler Caesar was, there can be no denying his contributions both to Rome which would soon emerge as the Roman Empire, and to modern civilization. In his battles, Caesar brought the provinces of Italy under control and defeated his former co-ruler. Pompey the Great, who had, along with Caesar and Crassus, formed the first triumvirate, effectively ending the oligarchy that had ruled Rome. In so doing, he had succeeded in ending the disorder that had plagued Rome for decades and laid the groundwork for the formation of the empire under his grandnephew Augustus in 27 BC, while Caesar was in office. He planned and carried out several reforms, not the least of which was the implementation of the Julian calendar which he introduced in 46 BC. The Gregorian calendar we use today evolved from it. Caesar also left a legacy of literature, he penned a total of 10 books on his battles in Gaul. C 58-50 BC, and on the Civil War, which he had more or less started in. 49 BC. These clear commentaries are still considered masterpieces of military history. What impact have VCRs and digital recorders had on television viewing? Since VCRs, invented 1975, and the more recent digital recorders such as TiVo give viewers the ability to record television programs and watch them when they choose, a phenomenon known as time-shifting has emerged. As Americans watch previously recorded programming, they miss primetime broadcasts. Commentators mused that Americans were losing a sense of community gone were the days when office. Workers would stand around the water cooler to chat about last night's episode of a popular program. 
since these recording devices also gave viewers the ability to fast forward through commercials. A practice dubbed zapping, they posed challenges to the advertising industry. What was the progressive movement? It was a campaign for reform on every level social, political, and economic in the United States. It began during the economic depression that was brought on by the panic. Of 1873 and lasted until 1917, when Americans entered World War I, 1914-18. During the first 100 years of the U.S. Constitution, 1788, federal lawmakers and justices proved reluctant to get involved in or attempt to regulate private business. This policy of non-interference had allowed the gap to widen between rich and poor. The turn of the century was a time in America when early industrialists built fantastic, mansions while many workers and farmers struggled to earn a living, when tenement houses sprang up in urban areas to meet. Albeit horribly inadequately, the housing needs made present by a steady stream of immigrants. And when labor unions, which had only recently begun to organize, were beset by outbreaks of violence, hurting their fight for better treatment by employers. Observing these problems, progressive-minded reformers, comprised largely of middle-class Americans, women, and journalists, the so-called muckrakers, began reform campaigns at the local and state levels, eventually affecting changes at the federal level. Progressives favored many of the ideas that had previously been espoused by the populists. Including antitrust legislation to bust up the monopolies and a graduated income. Tax to more adequately collect public funds from the nation's well-to-do businessmen. Additionally, progressives combated corrupt local governments. Dirty and dangerous working conditions in factories, mines, and fields, and inner city blight. The minimum wage, the Pure Food and Drug Act, and Chicago's Hull House, which served as an incubator for the American social work movement, are part of the legacy of the progressive movement. What was Nietzsche's philosophy about the will to power? The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche 1844 to 1900 developed many theories of human behavior and the will to power was one of these. While other philosophers including the ancient Greek Epicurus, argued that humans are motivated by a desire to experience pleasure, Nietzsche asserted that it was neither pleasure nor the avoidance of pain that inspires humankind, but rather the desire for strength and power. He argued that in order to gain power, humans would even be willing to embrace pain. However, it's critical to note that he did not view this will to power strictly as a will to dominate others. Nietzsche glorified a superman or overman. Ubermensch, an individual who could assert power over himself, or herself. 
he viewed artists as one example of an overman since that person successfully harnesses his or her instincts through creativity and in so doing has actually achieved a higher form of power than would the person who only wishes to dominate others. A notable exception to Nietzsche's esteem for artists was the composer Richard Wagner. 1813-1883, whom the philosopher opposed. Since Wagner led an immoral lifestyle, unlike the Ubermensch, Nietzsche maintained that the composer had not gained power over his own instincts. Nietzsche was a professor of classics at the University of Basel in Switzerland from 1868 to 1878. Retiring due to poor health, he turned to his writing, which included poetry. In 1889 he suffered a mental breakdown and died the next year. After his death, his sister, Elizabeth Forster Nietzsche, 1846-1935, altered her brother's works in editing, changing their meaning. In 1895 she married an anti-Semitic agitator, Bernhard Forster, 1843-1889, who, with his wife, attempted to establish a pure Aryan, a non-Jewish Caucasian, colony in Paraguay. The effort failed, and Forster took his own life. These events and, more importantly, the changes to the philosopher's own words resulted in the popular misconception that Nietzsche's philosophies had given rise to Nazism. What were the hallmarks of the Cold War era? At home the hysteria of the Cold War era reached its height with the so-called McCarthyism of the 1950s. Historian Doris Kearns Goodwin described it as one of the most destructive chapters in American political history. In early 1950 Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy, 1908-1957, of Wisconsin claimed to possess a list of more than 200 known communists in the U.S. State Department. The startling accusation launched congressional inquiries conducted by the Senators Subcommittee and the House Committee to investigate un-American activities. Suspicions of communist subversion ran high even in Hollywood where a blacklist named those who were believed to have been involved in the Communist Party. McCarthy never produced his laundry list of offenders in the State Department. And the sorry chapter was closed when, on live television, the senator's bitter attacks went too far. In televised hearings in 1954, the senator took on the U.S. Army. Determined to ferret out what he believed was a conspiracy to cover up a known communist in the ranks. Faced with McCarthy's slanderous line of questioning, Army Counsel Joseph Welch. 1890-1960, delivered a reply that finally disarmed McCarthy, saying have you no sense of decency, sir? If there is a God in heaven, your attacks will do neither you nor your cause any good. The retort was met with applause in the courtroom. Heralding the end of the communist in our midst hysteria. But the Cold War deepened during the course of the 1950s. 
as distrust on both sides was increased by the shadow of possible nuclear destruction. Both the United States and the Soviet Union funneled vast resources into the development of weapon systems. As each side believed deterrence would determine the victor in the Cold War. It would be won by the nation able to create weapons so powerful that the other nation would be deterred from attacking. The military build-up became an all-out arms race. Competition between the Eastern Bloc and the West spilled over into athletics, the arts, and the sciences. In 1957 the Soviets beat the West into space with the launch of the first artificial satellite. Sputnik, which they followed in 1961 by completing the first successful manned space launch. The United States responded by stepping up its space program and vowing to put a man on the moon. Events in the early 1960s heightened tensions between the two sides, causing many to fear the war would turn hot. When an American U-2 spy plane was shot down over the Soviet Union and its pilot was captured in 1960, the United States was forced to admit to conducting a program of aerial reconnaissance. In 1961, the U.S. backed invasion of Cuba, known as the Bay of Pigs, failed. Revealing American involvement in the plot, also that year, the Berlin Wall was built to stop the flow of emigrants out of East Germany. And becoming a visible symbol of the division between East and West. And in 1962 U.S. President John Kennedy, 1917-1963, and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, 1894-1971. Squared off in the Cuban Missile Crisis a full-scale conflict was averted through diplomacy. Later in the decade and into the 1970s, tensions relaxed and both sides began agreeing to limit the arms race. Signing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968 and the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. SALT I, in 1972, and agreeing to the Helsinki Accords in 1975 but East and West remained suspicious and watchful of each other into the 1980s. Most observers agree the Cold War did not come to an end. Until the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, see 1990. Why were Tsars Peter and Catherine known as the Great? The epithet the Great can be misleading, while Romanov Tsars Peter the Great, who ruled from 1682 to 1725, and Catherine the Great, who ruled from 1762 to 1796, are among the best known of the Romanov dynasty and both had many accomplishments during their reigns. They are also known for having increased their power at the expense of others. Peter is recognized for introducing Western European civilization to Russia and for elevating Russia to the status of a great European power. But he also relied on the serfs, the peasants who were little more than indentured servants to the lords. Not only to provide the bulk of the funding he needed to fight almost continuous wars, but for the manpower as well, most soldiers were serfs. The men responsible for establishing schools, including the Academy of Sciences, reforming the calendar, and simplifying the alphabet also carried out ruthless 
reforms. Peter's most vainglorious act was, perhaps, to move the capital from Moscow to the city he had built for himself on the swampy land ceded by Sweden, St. Petersburg, known as Petrograd 1914 to 24, as Leningrad 1924 to 91. As his window on Europe, Peter succeeded in making the city into a brilliant cultural center. For her part, Catherine the Great may well be acknowledged as a patron of the arts and literature. One who corresponded with the likes of French writer Voltaire, 1694-1778, but she, too, increased the privileges of the nobility while making the lives of the serfs even more miserable. Her true colors were shown by how she ascended to power in the first place. In 1744 she married Peter, III, who became Tsar of Russia in 1762. That same year, Catherine conspired with her husband's enemies to depose him. He was later killed. And so Catherine came to power, proclaiming herself Tsarina. She began her reign by attempting reforms, but a peasant uprising, 1773-74, and the French Revolution, which began in 1789, prompted her only to strengthen and protect her absolute authority. Like Peter the Great, she, too, extended the frontiers of the empire through a series of conquests. By the end of her reign, in 1796, Catherine had reduced even the free peasants to the level of serfdom. Did the Europeans introduce anything besides disease to the Americas? Yes, in addition to certain diseases, which were accidentally imported into the New World by the early Europeans. The explorers brought with them many things that were previously unknown in the Americas. When Christopher Columbus, 1451-1506, landed at Hispaniola, present-day Haiti and Dominican Republic in the Caribbean, in 1492, he carried with him horses and cattle. These were the first seen in the Western Hemisphere. The American Indians had no beasts of burden prior to the arrival of the Europeans. In subsequent trips, Europeans introduced horses and livestock, including cattle, sheep, pigs, goats, and chickens, throughout South and North America. They later carried plants from Europe and the East back to the Americas, where they took hold. These included rice, sugar, indigo, wheat, and citrus fruits all of which became established in the Western Hemisphere and became important crops during colonial times. With the exception of indigo, which was used as a fabric dye. These non-indigenous crops remain important to the countries of North and South America. What is the war on terror? In his remarks the evening of September 11, 2001, President George W. Bush, 1946, vowed that America and our friends and allies join with all those who want peace and security in the world. 
and we stand together to win the war against terrorism. TV newscasts were soon emblazoned with the message. America's War on Terror, or simply, The War on Terror. The events of 9-11 catapulted the free world into a new era. In which conflicts no longer were limited to wars between nations. There was a new enemy, which knew no national boundaries. Whose army was covered, and which mercilessly targeted civilians. Acknowledging that the new threat could not be met by the United States alone. The Bush administration began forging an alliance of nations that together would use diplomacy, take military action, and coordinate intelligence and law enforcement efforts to combat terrorists around the globe. On September 12, 2001, Secretary of State Colin Powell 1937, called for a global coalition against terrorism. Eventually the Bush administration put together an alliance of 84 countries. Called the Global Coalition Against Terrorism, united against a common danger, and joined in a common purpose. The strike on Afghanistan, called Operation Enduring Freedom was the first military strategy in the new war. The next major initiative was the war in Iraq. While those operations were underway, terrorist strikes continued around the globe. In March 2004, following the commuter train blasts in Spain, President Bush remarked that the murders in Madrid are a reminder that the civilized world is at war. And in this new kind of war, civilians find themselves suddenly on the front lines. In recent years, terrorists have struck from Spain, to Russia, to Israel. To East Africa, to Morocco, to the Philippines, and to the United States. They've targeted Arab states such as Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Yemen. They've attacked Muslims in Indonesia, Turkey, Pakistan, Iraq, and Afghanistan. No nation or region is exempt from the terrorists' campaign of violence. What were Sir Francis Bacon's beliefs? The English philosopher, author, and statesman was one of the great minds of the scientific revolution of the 1500s and 1600s during which the way that Europeans viewed themselves and the universe underwent a dramatic change. Bacon, 1561-1626, believed that humankind's accepted notions about nature should be aggressively challenged. As a young man studying at Trinity College, he concluded that the Aristotelian system or deductive logic, was without merit, Bacon favored observation. Or inductive logic, as a system for interpreting and understanding nature. He argued that the understanding of nature was being held back by the blind acceptance of the beliefs of ancient philosophers such as Aristotle, 384-322 BC, and Plato. C 428 to 347 BC. A religious person, Bacon maintained that theology should not be questioned. 
he believed that rational inquiry can unlock the secrets of nature but not of the human soul. Bacon therefore insisted on the separation of philosophy and theology. An idea that ran counter to the academic traditions of the time. Consequently he was a staunch proponent of educational and scientific reform. Trained in law, Bacon served as a royal diplomat in France, was admitted to the bar, elected to parliament. And served in public office, including the jobs of solicitor general and attorney general. He penned several seminal works, including essays, 1597, which consists of practical wisdom and observations. Advancement of Learning, 1605, A Survey of the State of Knowledge. Bacon was attempting to enlist the support of the king in the total reform of education and science in England, and Novum Organum, 1620. In which he put forth his method for understanding nature by an inductive system, based on direct observation. Versus Aristotle's deductive method, which was based on circumstantial evidence and prior conclusions. Who were the brothers Grimm? The German brothers Jacob, 1785 to 1863, and Wilhelm, 1786 to 1859. Best known for their fairy tales, were actually librarians and professors who studied law. Together wrote a dictionary of the German language, and lectured at universities. In 1805 Jacob traveled to Paris to conduct research on Roman law. And in a library there he found medieval German manuscripts of old stories that were slowly disintegrating. He decided the tales were too valuable to lose, and he vowed to collect them. The brothers' interest in fairy tales also led them to search for old traditions. Legends, and tales, especially those meant for children. They traveled the German countryside, interviewing villagers in an effort to gather. Stories most of which were from the oral tradition and had never been written down. The brothers were diligent in their efforts. Recording everything faithfully so that nothing was added and nothing was left out. When the first volume of Kind Rundhausmarchen, literally, the children's household tales. But known better as Grimm's Fairy Tales, was published in 1812, children loved it. Subsequent volumes were published in German through 1815. The fairy tales collected in the multi-volume work included such classics as the history of Tom Thumb, Little Red Riding Hood, Bluebeard, Puss in Boots, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, The Princess and the Pea, The Sleeping Beauty in the Wood, and Cinderella. What is behaviorism? Behaviorism is a school of psychology that attempts to explain human behavior in terms of responses to environmental stimuli. Influenced by the conditioned reflex demonstrated by Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov. 1849 to 1936, 
American psychologist John Broadus Watson, 1878 to 1958, of Johns Hopkins University. Codified and popularized the theory, which discards introspection and consciousness as influences on human behavior. Behaviorism was further studied by another American psychologist and Harvard professor B. F. Skinner. 1904-1990, Skinner focused his work on patterns of responses to observable stimuli, versus unobservable stimuli such as introspection and conscience, and external rewards. Applied to human learning, Skinner's theories on behaviorism affected educational methods, which tangibly reward good behavior. Were the Spaniards the first Europeans to reach North America after the Vikings? No, that distinction goes to explorer John Cabot, c. 1451 to 1498, who in 1497 sailed westward from Bristol, England. In search of a trade route to the east. Cabot's story began in 1493, when Christopher Columbus. 1451 to 1506 returned to Spain from his New World voyage, claiming to have reached Asia. From the accounts of the trip, Cabot, who was himself a navigator, believed it was unlikely that Columbus had traveled that far. He did, however, believe it was possible, as did subsequent explorers. To find a route a northwest passage that ran north of the land mass Columbus had discovered, and by which Asia could be reached. In 1495 the Italian Cabot, born Giovanni Caboto, took his family to England, and the following year. In March, appealed to King Henry VII, 1457-1509, for his endorsement in pursuing the plan. For his part, the king, who was well aware of the claims made by the Spanish and Portuguese who had sponsored their own explorations, was eager to find new lands to rule. And so he granted a patent, authorizing Cabot's expedition. Later that year, 1496, Cabot set sail. But problems on board the ship and foul weather forced him to turn back. The following spring, on May 20, 1497, he sailed again, in a small ship that had been christened Matthew. The crew of 20 included his son, Sebastian. On June 24, they sighted land and Cabot went ashore. While he saw signs of human habitation, he encountered no one. From reports of the trip, scholars believe Cabot had reached the coasts of present-day Maine, Nova Scotia, and probably Newfoundland. He then sailed home, returning to England on August 6. He reported to the king six days later and was given a reward as well as authorization for a more sizable expedition, which he undertook in May 1498. This time Cabot set sail with five ships in his command. But the expedition was not heard from again. What happened at Pearl Harbor?
On the night before the attack, the Japanese moved a fleet of 33 ships to within 200 miles of the Hawaiian island of Oahu, where Pearl Harbor is situated. More than 300 planes took off from the Japanese carriers. Dropping the first bombs on Pearl Harbor just before 8 a.m. on December 7. 1941 There were eight American battleships and more than 90 naval vessels in the harbor at the time. 21 of these were destroyed or damaged, as were 300 planes. The biggest single loss of the day was the sinking of the battleship USS Arizona, which went down in less than nine minutes. More than half the fatalities at Pearl Harbor that infamous. December day were due to the sinking of the Arizona. By the end of the raid, more than 2,300 people had been killed and about the same number were wounded. Pearl Harbor forever changed the United States and its role in the world. When President Franklin D. Roosevelt 1882-1945, addressed Congress the next day, he called December 7 a date which will live in infamy. The United States declared war against Japan. And on December 11 Germany and Italy Japan's Axis allies declared war on the United States. The events of December 7 had brought America into the war. A conflict from which it would emerge as the leader of the free world. When did the first U.S. What is Hinduism? Hinduism an ancient religion that originated about 1500 B. C and developed over thousands of years. Encompasses the beliefs and practices of the numerous religious sects of India. Each sect has its own philosophy and form of worship. It is a polytheistic religion believing in many gods as well as in one great god or universal spirit, called Brahman. Hindu doctrine is centered on sacred scriptures including the Veda, which includes the Upanishads. Dialogues describing sacrificial rituals and religious ceremonies, the Puranas, stories about Hindu gods and goddesses. And the Mahabharata, which contains the Bhagavad Gita, or the Song of the Lord in which the god Krishna discusses the meaning of life with a warrior prince on the eve of battle. Hindus worship alone at temples, which are dedicated to divinities. Followers also practice yoga, believing that it leads to knowledge and union with God. Were any 9-11th conspirators convicted? Yes, but by 2005 there had been only one, French citizen Zacharias Moussaoui, 1968, was convicted in AU. S. Court in Alexandria, Virginia. In connection with the September 11, 2001, attacks that claimed nearly 3,000 lives, Musawi was taken into custody by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI. In August 2001, a flight instructor in Minnesota, where he was training, had reported him as suspicious. After the September terrorist attacks, 
Musawi continued to be held as the possible 20th hijacker. One of the flights on September 11th had four hijackers, the other three flights each had five. For the next three years, the suspected terrorist was the subject of a sometimes dramatic legal battle. Musawi insulted the U.S. district judge hearing his case. Attempted to fire his lawyers, and pleaded guilty only to later change his mind. On April 22, 2005, the case came to close when Musawi admitted his guilt in front of a packed courtroom. His sentencing trial was set for 2006. Where does the word Pope come from? The word Pope is derived from the Greek word Papas, meaning Papa, Father. The Pope is also referred to as the Holy Father, the Vicar of Christ, and Pontiff. When did IBM enter the personal computer business? IBM, International Business Machines, organized in 1924, had long been an industry leader in developing and producing computers for business and science, but in August 1981, the company jumped into the consumer business. Competing with upstart Apple for a share in the personal computer, PC, business. The PC introduced by IBM used a Microsoft Disk operating system. MS-DOS, and soon captured 75% of the market. Observing the company's enormous success, other firms began producing IBM clones. Which could use the same software as the IBM PC. What was the Munich Pact? It was a failed effort to appease the territory and power-hungry German leader Adolf Hitler. 1889-1945, in the days leading up to World War II, 1939-45. After Germany annexed neighboring Austria in the Anschluss of March 1938, it became known that Hitler had designs on the Sudetenland, a heavily German region of Czechoslovakia. With World War I, 1914-18, a fresh memory, and European nations still recovering from heavy losses. Europe's powers were eager to avoid another conflict. On September 29 and 30, 1938, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain met with Hitler in Munich. They were joined by Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, a German ally, and French Premier Edouard Daladier, a Czech ally. Czechoslovakia did not have any representatives at the conference. The leaders quickly worked out a plan for Germany to occupy the Sudetenland. Chamberlain considered Czechoslovakia's concession a reasonable price to pay for peace on the continent. But the effort to assuage Hitler was not successful, in March 1939 Germany moved to occupy the rest of Czechoslovakia. On September 1st, Germany marched into Poland, and World War II began.
What was the long march? The long march began in October 1934 when Mao Zedong (1893–1976) led Chinese communist forces. The Red Army of China, numbering 100,000 men and women, on an epic walk across China, with the Nationalist Army in pursuit. The communist marchers crossed 18 mountain chains and 24 rivers to cover 6,000 miles. Almost all women and children died along the way. In 1935, 20,000 to 30,000 people finally reached Shaanxi, Shenzi, province in the north. Where the Red Army established a stronghold. It was there that Mao, one of the earliest members of the Chinese Communist Party, formulated his own philosophy that came to be known as Maoism. He had adapted Marxism to the Chinese conditions replacing German politician and socialist Karl Marx's. 1818-1883 to 1883, Urban working class with the peasant farmers as the force behind revolution. The Red Army went on to defeat the Nationalists in 1949, Mao was named Chairman of the People's Republic of China, a communist state, that same year. What led to the decline of communism in Eastern Europe? Anti-communist sentiment among Eastern Europeans was bolstered by the actions and policies of Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, 1931. When Gorbachev took office in 1985, the Soviet economy was in decline. In order to reverse the trend, he advocated dramatic reforms to move the economy away from the government-controlled communist, system and toward a decentralized system, similar to those of Western democracies. Gorbachev's efforts to modernize the Soviet Union were not limited to the economy. He further proposed a reduction in the power of the Communist Party, which had controlled the country since 1917. Gorbachev's programs for reform were termed perestroika, meaning restructuring. In the meantime, Gorbachev opened up relations with the West, which included visits with U.S. President Ronald Reagan. 1911-2004, who strongly supported the Soviet leaders' programs. Gorbachev referred to his policy of openness as glasnost. Both Russian terms quickly caught on around the world. While the economic reforms produced a slow and painful change for the Soviet people and Gorbachev had many detractors, including government officials. He also had many supporters both inside and outside the Soviet Union. People in other Eastern European countries watched with Interest the Soviet move toward a more democratic system. Strikes in Poland had begun as early as 1980, where workers formed a free labor union called Solidarity. But the following year, the communist leaders of the Soviet Union pressured the Polish government to put an end to the movement which it did. After Gorbachev became head of the Soviet Union and initiated sweeping changes, the reform movements in other countries soon realized that the Soviets under Gorbachev would 
no longer take hard-handed tactics toward anti-communist efforts in other countries. In 1989 the Polish government ceased to prohibit solidarity, and the Communist Party there lost influence. The same was true in Hungary, East Germany, and Czechoslovakia. By the end of the decade, most of the Eastern European Communist governments were overthrown in favor of democratic-oriented governments. The transition was effected differently in each country. The overthrow in Czechoslovakia was so peaceful that it was called the Velvet Revolution, while in Romania. A bloody revolt ensued, and hardline communist dictator Nicolae Ceausescu, 1918-1989, was executed. In 1990 multi-party elections were held in Romania, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, East Germany, and Bulgaria. The non-communist party that was put in power in East Germany agreed to unification with West Germany. Again creating one Germany on October 3rd. 1990 that same year Gorbachev received the Nobel Peace Prize for his contributions to world peace. What was the Lyceum Movement? It was a public education movement that began in the 1820s and is credited with promoting the establishment of public schools, libraries, and museums in the United States. The idea was conceived by Yale-educated teacher and lecturer Josiah Holbrook. 1788-1854, who in 1826 set up the first American Lyceum in Millbury, Massachusetts. He named the program for the place a grove near the Temple of Apollo Lycers where the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle 384 to 322 BC, taught his students. The Lyceums, which were programs of regularly occurring lectures, proved to be the right idea at the right time, they got underway just after the completion of the Erie Canal. 1825, which permitted the settlement of the nation's interior. Just as the notion that universal, free education was imperative to the preservation of American democracy took hold. The movement spread quickly. At first the lectures were homegrown affairs, featuring local speakers. But as the movement grew, lyceum bureaus were organized. Which sent paid lecturers to speak to audiences around the country. The Lyceum speakers included such noted Americans as writers Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803-1882, Henry David Thoreau, 1817-1862, and Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1804-1864, as well as activist Susan B. Anthony, 1820-1906. After the Civil War, 1861 to 65 The educational role of the Lyceum movement was taken over by the Protestant led Chautauquas What was Teapot Dome Teapot Dome was a notorious political scandal that was on a level with Watergate, 1972. While the early 1920s abuses of power affected President Warren G. Harding, 1865-1923, to 
it was not Harding who was implicated in the crimes. Albert Bacon Fall, 1861-1944, Harding Secretary of the Interior Secretly transferred government oil lands at Elk Hills, California, and Teapot Dome. Wyoming, to private use and he did so without a formal bidding process. Fall leased the Elk Hills Naval Oil Reserves to American businessman Edward L. Doheny, 1856-1935, in exchange for an interest-free loan of $100,000. Fall made a similar arrangement with another businessman, Harry F. Sinclair, 1876-1956, of Sinclair Oil Corporation leasing the teapot. Dome reserves in exchange for $300,000 in cash, bonds, and livestock. The scandal was revealed in 1922. And committees of the U.S. Senate and a special commission spent the next six years sorting it all out. By the time the hearings and investigations were concluded in 1928, Harding had died. Fall had resigned from office and taken a job working for Sinclair, all three players Doheny, Sinclair. And Fall had faced charges, and the government had successfully sued the oil companies for the return of the lands. The punishments were light considering the serious nature of the charges, Fall was convicted of accepting a bribe. Fined $100,000, and sentenced to a year in prison. While Doheny and Sinclair were both indicted but later acquitted of the charges against them, which included conspiracy and bribery. <laughs>